In the early 2000s, World War II shooters were seemingly everywhere. Call of Duty, Medal of Honor, and an endless stream of clones and knockoffs pervaded both personal computers and home consoles. While fun, these experiences were often formulaic, casting players time and time again as frontline soldiers in bombastic but heavily scripted action sequences across the war's greatest flashpoints. Running and gunning alone into the thick of battle was the name of the game, with little in the way of realism. In the midst of this flood of homogenous experiences, one series of World War II shooters stood out above the rest, Brothers in Arms. Developed by Gearbox Software and published by Ubisoft, Brothers in Arms emphasized real-world tactics and teamwork over mindless gunplay, forcing players to work together with their in-game allies to overcome conflicts. While Brothers in Arms would experience a wave of popularity following its debut in 2005, bolstered by its affecting narrative and unique gameplay, its fame would gradually wane over time. Changing market conditions, a stream of middling mobile releases, and Gearbox's shifting priorities would slowly but surely drown the series out of the public conscience. And though there is reason to hope that the series may yet live again, an ill-fated attempt to revitalize the series in 2011 suggests that a new entry may still be far on the horizon. This is the rise and fall of Brothers in Arms. Since its establishment in 1999, Gearbox Software had thrived creating expansion packs and ports for other developers' games. The company's first work, Opposing Force, was an expansion for Valve's seminal first-person shooter Half-Life, told from the perspective of one of the main game's enemy characters. The expansion was well received, with critics praising its engaging story and level design. By the mid-2000s, Gearbox had established a solid reputation for itself with two more Half-Life expansions and PC ports of popular titles such as Halo Combat Evolved and Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3 under its belt. But it was ready to create something original. Gearbox wanted to make a realistic first-person shooter set in the Second World War during the Normandy landings, one that would attempt to recreate 1944 France down to the accuracy of the streets buildings, and regiment of paratroopers the player would fight alongside. Where prior video games were content to play fast and loose with their historicity, Gearbox Software's first original game would make every effort to provide as authentic an experience as possible. In order to do so, Gearbox Software hired U.S. Army Colonel John Antell. Mortar started falling in the middle of the town square, and uh, this is it. No, church is this way. I know, but this is the square where the sword Yes, this is exactly where. Right. And right over here is yeah. the uh, where they lined, every, lined everybody up. Drawing upon both his past career and extensive knowledge of military history, Antel helped Gearbox bring their painstakingly realistic vision of war-torn Normandy to life, bringing the development team to real-life battlefields upon which to draw inspiration, and introducing the developers to both active soldiers and veterans alike, so as to provide them with an intimate understanding of military officers' experience in the heat of combat. Finally, after much blood, sweat, and research, Gearbox's first self-owned opus was ready. In March of 2005, the studio would release Brothers in Arms Road to Hill 30 for the PlayStation 2, Xbox, and PC. In nearly all aspects of its design, Road to Hill 30 is effectively an antithesis to the World War II shooters present at the time in which it was released. In contrast to Call of Duty and Medal of Honor, whose high-energy narratives typically bounce between various locations over the course of several months, Road to Hill 30's story is focused and emotional, reminiscent of the television series Band of Brothers. Based on the real-life events of the historical Mission Albany, Road to Hill 30 cast players in the role of Sergeant Matt Baker of the 502nd Parachute Infantry Regiment. After being dropped behind enemy lines on the eve of D-Day, 
The game follows Matt and his squad as they struggle to liberate several towns in Normandy over the course of eight grueling days. The further they progress, the more the horrors of war strip their souls bare, leaving Matt and his squad both physically and emotionally indebted to each other's support. This unique focus on the intimacy between Matt and his team extends directly to Road to Hill 30's gameplay, where prior shooters offered players an arsenal of highly accurate firearms that encourage shooting recklessly and from afar. Road to Hill 30's firearms are both inaccurate and erratic. As a result, true to the actual era on which the game is based, the game encourages players to use the four Fs of combat to eliminate threats. Find the enemy, fix them with suppressing fire, flank them with another fire team, and finish them off. As Matt, the player uses simple contextual commands to direct their squad into performing the four Fs, all the while making their way across the battlefield. In addition, the game can at most times be switched to a top-down perspective, known as the situational awareness view, allowing the player to survey their environment for enemy positions and areas of cover uninhibited by the view in front of them. While this feature is obviously not as realistic as the rest of the game's mechanics, it further reinforces the game's tactical nature, calling to mind real-time and turn-based strategy games such as Command & Conquer or Company of Heroes. However, while these systems offered a much-needed breath of fresh air at the time of Road to Hill 30's release, their execution is far from perfect. Keep your eyes peeled for more! Uh! Anchor, get back! Road to Hill 30's levels are often claustrophobic in their design, funneling the player forward and restricting the amount of opportunities they have to actually approach challenges tactically. Meanwhile, the game's enemy AI is simple, with most opponents remaining rooted in one place. While this makes finding, fixing, flanking, and finishing opponents easy early on, it ultimately results in the 4F's formula feeling increasingly repetitive the more the game progresses. The PlayStation 2 version of the game is also notably less balanced than its fellow versions, with cover providing less protection and enemies being more difficult to incapacitate when being fixed with ally fire. While the PlayStation 2 version is still a strong experience overall, the game is better played on either the Xbox or PC. In addition to its single-player campaign, Road to Hill 30 also features standard multiplayer offerings in which players would control squads of AI teammates to outwit and defeat each other. While it didn't take the world by storm and its online servers would eventually be shut down, it was nonetheless a solid proof of concept that Gearbox would iterate upon in the future. Road to Hill 30 was far from a perfect game, but in an era in which its contemporaries almost exclusively offered Hollywood-style interpretations of the Second World War, it did something different, and it did it well. With an engaging single-player campaign that emphasized the intimacy of its protagonists in both its gameplay as well as its story, and a solid multiplayer suite, Road to Hill 30 was both a hit amongst players and enough of a commercial success to guarantee a rapid sequel. A mere seven months after the release of Road to Hill 30, Gearbox would release Brothers in Arms Earned in Blood in October of 2005 for the Xbox, PlayStation 2, and PC, with a mobile version released in the same month by mobile game developer Gameloft. Taking place during and shortly after the events of the first game, Earned in Blood cast players as Joe Red Hartsock, one of Matt Baker's foremost companions in Hill 30, and follows him both under Matt's leadership and as the commander of his own squad in their continuing struggle to liberate Nazi-occupied Normandy. While Earned in Blood doesn't drastically reinvent what its predecessor began, its gameplay offers a host of new features and improvements. Chief among them are the game's vastly improved enemy AI. Rather than stay rooted in one spot for the player to find, fix, flank, and finish, enemy soldiers now react dynamically to the player's position. They'll move from cover to cover, attempt flanking maneuvers of their own, and be reinforced by other units as the battle progresses. This, combined with the game's battlefields, which are much more spacious and varied, results in enemy encounters being far more challenging and open-ended than what was offered in Road to Hill 30. Should you charge right into town and attempt to gun down the Germans before they can get too close to you? Or is it better to flank the town off to the right until you find advantageous terrain from which to fire on your enemies? Tactical questions of this nature comprise the bulk of Earned in Blood, 
making the game far more engaging from top to bottom than its predecessor. Earned in Blood's multiplayer offerings are also much more expanded over Road to Hill 30s. The game's original competitive multiplayer suite includes more maps, and a new cooperative multiplayer mode, titled Skirmish Mode, allows players to play through the game's single-player missions as a team, or take on other self-contained scenarios with unique and challenging win conditions. Like Road to Hill 30, however, its online servers would eventually be pulled, meaning that Skirmish Mode can currently only be experienced locally. Earned in Blood would be well received by critics and players alike. While some lamented how similar the game was to its predecessor, its swath of mechanical improvements, the inclusion of Skirmish Mode, and the impressively short turnaround time in which they were implemented appeased many. With Road to Hill 30, Gearbox established Brothers in Arms as a force to be reckoned with in the first-person shooter space, and with Earned in Blood, they had further cemented its authority by responding quickly to players' criticisms. Once again, however, the PlayStation 2 version of the game possessed a few notable drawbacks. Hurry up, over there. Roger that. The AI of the player's squad is decidedly less intelligent than that of the Xbox or PC, frequently getting stuck on objects or responding incorrectly to the player's commands, and the game's multiplayer offerings would suffer from severe lag when played online. While these platform-specific issues did little to tarnish its game's overall legacy, both Road to Hill 30 and Earned in Blood's problems on the PlayStation 2 would come to haunt the series later on. But before that could happen, the franchise would see itself expand to nearly every platform under the sun. In the interim following Earned in Blood's release, Gearbox was eager to quickly capitalize on the series' newfound success and Sony's powerful new portable console, the PlayStation Portable, seemed the perfect home for ports of 3D action games from home consoles. And so, in November of 2006, Brothers in Arms D-Day would release for the PlayStation Portable. Developed by Ubisoft Shanghai, D-Day follows Matt and Red's exploits from the series' previous games, recycling past missions and scenarios in what is effectively a scaled-down supercut of Road to Hill 30 and Earned in Blood's best single-player missions. While technically impressive for the time in which it was released, many of the PlayStation Portable shortcomings weaken the experience. The portable console's middling processing power results in many of the game's more intensive segments running poorly, and its analog nub lacks the versatility to control both the player and their squad effectively. The result is an experience that, while by no means bad, is difficult to recommend over the two games it is patchworked from. The game received a lukewarm critical and commercial reception and failed to attract the same enthusiasm as the series prior to releases. But it demonstrated that the series could function, albeit in a limited fashion, in portable form prompting a slow but uninterrupted invasion of portable and mobile games for the rest of this series' life. The series' next entry, Brothers in Arms DS, would release for the Nintendo DS in June of 2007. Developed by Gameloft, the title is effectively a Brothers in Arms game in name only. Taking place from a third-person instead of a first-person perspective, Brothers in Arms DS is a linear and scripted experience, more in the vein of Call of Duty, largely doing away with the tactical elements that characterized its predecessors and featuring little in the way of story. Ah! Ah! Judged on its own merits, however, the game is not that bad. As a technical showcase for the Nintendo DS's capabilities, Brothers in Arms DS is impressive. In addition to featuring detailed 3D environments and surprisingly high-quality audio, the game makes strong use of the DS's stylus for aiming and selecting weaponry, making up for the console's lack of analog sticks. For Nintendo DS owners looking for a solid action fix in the middle of this system's life, Brothers in Arms DS was a fine choice. But to fans of the franchise's prior entries, it was of little interest an inoffensive but dissonant footnote to the still young series. While the PlayStation Portable and the Nintendo DS had helped Brothers in Arms remain in the public consciousness throughout 2006 and 2007, 
2008 would end up being the franchise's biggest year since its inception, with no fewer than five different games released. First, Brothers in Arms DS would see itself ported to both the Nokia N-Gage and the iPhone by Gameloft. The N-Gage port released in July of 2008, simply titled Brothers in Arms, is vastly inferior to its DS cousin. In addition to suffering from poor frame rate, players using an N-Gage with only one set of directional buttons are forced to control both the protagonist's movement and aiming using the same D-pad, turning the game into a chore to play. The iOS port, released in November, entitled Brothers in Arms Hour of Heroes isn't much better. While it lacks the frame rate issues of its N-Gage cousin, it suffers from its own clumsy control scheme that slows movement to a crawl. In contrast, Brothers in Arms Art of War, which was also developed by Gameloft but released earlier in the year, in March, manages to do far more with less. Unlike Hour of Heroes, which features fully 3D environments in which the player directly controls both their movement and camera, Art of War is a top-down, sprite-based action game reminiscent of classic arcade games. While once again a far cry from the series' tactical origins, the game is still solid in its own right, and most importantly, is relatively easy to control. Where with Hour of Heroes, Gameloft tried to force a DS game onto a platform unsuited to its complex control scheme, the developers of Art of War worked with the mobile phone's limited affordances to create a simpler but far more enjoyable experience. However, these titles did little to overshadow the Brothers in Arms series' fourth and most significant release of 2008, Brothers in Arms Hell's Highway. On three! Three! Released for Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 in September, and PC in October, Hell's Highway had experienced a long and troubled development. In addition to switching engines from Unreal Engine 2.0, which had been used for the series' first two games, to Unreal Engine 3.0, Gearbox struggled with developing for both the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360's hardware for the first time. Minor changes to the game's AI or graphics engine in one version would result in a butterfly effect of problems in the other versions, dragging out development far longer than it had intended. By the time Gearbox managed to release Hell's Highway, it would be two years after they had originally promised to do so, and what was there would prove satisfying but imperfect. Hell's Highway continues Matt Baker and the 502nd Infantry Regiment's story, chronicling their exploits in latter stages of the Second World War during the ill-fated Operation Market Garden in the Netherlands. Once again, Gearbox manages to nail the emotional and grounded feel that characterized the series' first two entries. When Matt's squad loses a single life or gains even a single inch of ground, one feels for them and their seemingly unending struggle. Hell's Highway's gameplay, however, is less faithful. Taking cues from the wider first-person shooter market, Hell's Highway does away with some of the tactical nuance of Road to Hill 30 and Earned in Blood. In its place, regenerating health, kill cams, and a cover system reminiscent of that of Gears of War make for a more cinematic and easier experience. The player still needs to overcome challenging tactical puzzles and respect the four Fs of combat, but the homogenizing pull of other contemporaneous shooters can be felt throughout its design. Meanwhile, the game's multiplayer attempted more of a class-based approach than its predecessors, encouraging players to fill a specific role while on the battlefield in order to succeed. While solid, its design made it difficult for players to win if one of their fellow soldiers decided to go lone wolf, and like its predecessors, its servers are no longer online. With Hell's Highway, Gearbox Software has succeeded once again in providing an engaging and tactical World War II shooter, but critical opinions weren't as kind as they had once been. Whether it was the game's increased similarity to the many other shooters around it, or the multiplayer's lack of oomph in a console generation where online multiplayer was becoming paramount, Hell's Highway failed to rouse the same enthusiasm that Road to Hill 30 and Earned in Blood received back in 2005. Not helping matters was that by 2008, players were becoming increasingly fatigued by World War II games. 
beginning with Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare, which transplanted its series from 1940s Europe to the Middle East, shooters were abandoning the 20th century conflict in favor of increasingly modern backdrops for their action. While Hell's Highway had good reason to stay in World War II, as the distinct circumstances and technology of the Second World War are intertwined with the series' narrative and gameplay, there's little doubt the title's setting made it appear increasingly passé at the time. Das kann nicht wahr sein! Das kann nicht... Scheiße! Scheiße! The same day that Hell's Highway was released on HD consoles, Nintendo Wii owners would receive their first and only title in the series, Brothers in Arms Double Time, a compilation of the first two games' single-player campaigns. Developed by Demiurge Studios, Double Time promised to elevate Road to Hill 30 and Earned in Blood's already strong core gameplay by providing players with the opportunity to direct their squad entirely using the Wii Remote's motion capabilities. Unfortunately, as with Hell's Highway, Double Time 2 would suffer from a troubled development. While Demiurge was committed to doing the Brothers in Arms brand proud on the Wii, Unclear design goals, inadequate staffing, and a lack of decisiveness as to how the game's motion control should be implemented would plague the title's creation and model the final product. In addition to running poorly, Double Time's motion controls rarely functioned as intended, making aiming the player's gun or issuing a command a struggle in and of itself. Making matters worse, the compilation is adapted from the PlayStation 2 version of the games, meaning all the same difficulty and AI issues that plague the PlayStation versions of Road to Hill 30 and Earned in Blood are present in Double Time. While ports on the Wii were often criticized for featuring shallow and tacked-on motion controls, not all of its motion-enhanced adaptions were a disappointment. Some, such as those of Okami or the Metroid Prime Trilogy, were able to strengthen their core gameplay through their inclusion of motion controls. With Double Time, Demiurge Studios genuinely wanted their game to stand alongside the latter titles, but was compounded by both its own failed efforts and specters of the series' past. The Brothers in Arms series had seen many outings in 2008, but it had failed to live up to the commercial expectations of its publisher, Ubisoft. While Hell's Highway would go on to become the series' most successful entry, selling close to 2 million copies on PC, PlayStation 3, and Xbox 360 combined, Double Time on the Wii limped behind, with little more than 130,000 copies sold. As a result, Ubisoft would double down on the series' safest investment, its mobile games, leading to the development of two more mobile titles from Gameloft. The first, Brothers in Arms 2 Global Front, would release in February of 2010 for the iPhone. Unlike Hour of Heroes, which takes place from a third-person perspective and features little in the way of narrative, Global Front takes place from a first-person perspective and contains a surprisingly robust story. Taking place during the outset of the Second World War, the game follows Corporal David Wilson's attempts to uncover the mysterious circumstances behind his brother's death, traveling across the globe in search of answers. It pales in comparison to the mainline series' narrative offerings, but it's there all the same. The game also sports a multiplayer mode, in which players can compete against each other locally or online to earn dog tags, which can be exchanged for weapons and other equipment in the game's single player. However, the title is otherwise not much different than Hour of Heroes, with simplistic shooting gameplay lacking tactical elements, linear level design, and a clunky control scheme, albeit one that is much improved over its predecessor. The second, Brothers in Arms 3 Sons of War, would release for both iOS and Android in December of 2014. Despite bearing a striking resemblance in both gameplay and graphics to the rather gung-ho Frontline Commando 2, also developed by Gameloft, and returning to using Hour of Heroes third-person perspective, Sons of War is arguably the series' most faithful mobile title. Taking place in the latter years of the Second World War, the game follows the exploits of Sergeant Cole Wright as he makes his way through the heart of Western Europe. Occasionally contemplative and even solemn, Sons of War still has little over its console brethren, but it does try. The game also features a new mechanic called the Brothers System, whereby the player can acquire squad mates possessing unique weapons and abilities, and issue orders to them as they play through the game's campaign, not dissimilar to the mainline entry's tactical features. 
While a nice gesture, the experience is unfortunately hampered by an aggressive microtransaction system that heavily incentivizes paying real money to unlock and upgrade weapons. All the while this was happening, Gearbox was slowly carving an identity for itself beyond Brothers in Arms. In October of 2009, Gearbox would release the first-person shooter, Borderlands. Featuring a significantly more eclectic and goofier atmosphere than Brothers in Arms, Borderlands would prove to be a massive critical and commercial hit, outdoing Hell's Highway's returns and spawning a franchise of successful sequels and spin-offs of its own. After struggling to make commercial headway with Brothers in Arms, Gearbox had found a new series which it could rely on for financial stability. It wasn't ready to give up on Brothers in Arms just yet, but perhaps as a result of both the changing tides of the first-person shooter market and a sense of creative security brought upon by Borderlands' success, it was ready to make some radical changes to it. Our partners at Ubisoft challenged us to take an entirely new approach to the World War II shooter, and we agreed to take up that challenge. So this is an entirely new take on war games. It's a new take on World War II. What I'm here to propose today is a game about a very special squad of soldiers. These guys are good at their jobs. They love their jobs. They, they're in it for the thrill of the fight, and they enjoy killing their enemies. These are soldiers whose favorite thing in the world is kicking Nazi ass. The story of this squad is incredible. It's, it's legendary. It's the stuff from which tall tales are born. I'd like to introduce all of you to meet the Furious Four. At Ubisoft's E3 2011 press conference, Gearbox would announce Brothers in Arms Furious Four for the Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and PC. Gone was the series' grounded narrative and focus on realistic period tactics. In its place was a four-player cooperative shooter that would follow a cartoonish cast of characters on a comical romp through Germany to assassinate Hitler. Killing enemies and completing challenges would reward players with experience points, which they could then spend on upgrading their weaponry. Levels would be spacious, bombastic, and filled with idiosyncratic technology, with an early demonstration of the title showcasing a Nazi funfair filled with jetpacks and helicopters. Brothers in Arms had previously brushed with Hollywood-style pizzazz with Hell's Highway's kill cams, but Furious 4 was well beyond anything the series had previously attempted. Where Road to Hill 30 and its successors evoked Saving Private Ryan's sobriety, Furious 4 brought to mind Inglorious Bastards history-defying lunacy. While some fans expressed cautious optimism towards the series' new direction, most were baffled. Where was the grounded experience that the prior three console games had so earnestly strived to represent? While it was understandable that Gearbox would want to experiment with the series' tenants to make it more financially viable, Furious 4 felt like the Brothers in Arms label had just been slapped onto it to generate interest. In response to this outpouring of criticism, Gearbox would decide to take stock and rework Furious 4 to better appease fans. After going silent on the title for close to a year, Gearbox CEO Randy Pitchford would announce in July of 2012 that the title was being shaken up, claiming that Furious 4 was, quote, evolving and we need to make further changes before we can start talking about it. Then, in September, Pitchford would reveal that in addition to having significantly evolved beyond what was shown at E3, Furious 4 would no longer sport the Brothers in Arms label. Information about the future of Furious 4 would thereafter remain scarce until July of 2015, when Pitchford would disclose that the title had been effectively killed off. In its place, much of the game's concepts ended up being repurposed for Gearbox's online first-person shooter, Battleborn. <laughs> While narratively distant from Furious 4's World War II setting, one can see how the former likely influenced the design of the latter. In addition to sharing an exaggerated and cartoony aesthetic style, both feature a cast of over-the-top characters with their own distinct and eccentric weapons. Outside of these remnants, however, the franchise has since been missing in action. When Gearbox Software released Road to Hill 30 in 2005, it was the perfect antidote to the then oversaturated World War II shooter genre. Where its competitors expounded Hollywood theatrics and gung-ho action, Brothers in Arms possessed sobering realism and tactical combat that forced players to use their allies to their fullest potential in order to survive. 
But as the series progressed, both internal and external forces bogged it down. An endless stream of portable and mobile spin-offs diluted the brand by offering experiences that, if not bad, failed to represent what made the series special, while the mainline series weakened its own cachet by molding itself to better resemble other popular shooters. And when Borderlands became a bigger hit, Gearbox no longer found itself needing to rely solely on Brothers in Arms. Meanwhile, many of Brothers in Arms' contemporaries moved away from World War II as a setting, with modern backdrops that reflected contemporary conflicts becoming the norm. This, combined with the dizzying rise in popularity of online multiplayer and first-person shooters, made it difficult for even a different shooter like Brothers in Arms, which both stuck fast to its World War II setting and struggled to innovate in its multiplayer department to compete. As a result, Gearbox would attempt to reinvent the franchise with Furious 4, a title that could have very well been a solid game in its own right, but went against everything that Brothers in Arms had previously prided itself on. And when fan backlash led Gearbox to distance Furious 4 from the Brothers in Arms name instead of standing its ground, it suggested that Gearbox no longer had a clear vision for what this series should be. Looking forward, the future of the Brothers in Arms franchise remains nebulous. On one hand, World War II has slowly become in vogue again as a setting, with major franchises such as Call of Duty returning to the conflict to frame and guide their design. And while online multiplayer remains an integral part of most first-person shooters, the current generation has segmented the genre with multiplayer-only shooters such as Overwatch, coexisting alongside single-player-only shooters such as Wolfenstein. Series such as Brothers in Arms have the possibility to thrive on the virtue of their single-player offerings alone. However, it's difficult to tell if Gearbox will ever give their due to the franchise. Randy Pitchford has repeatedly affirmed Gearbox's commitment to creating a proper sequel to Hell's Highway in the years following Furious 4's reveal. It's, it's hard, you know, it's been a while, and so I don't want to announce the, the yeah. thing until I know and am so, confident that what I'm announcing is what it'll be. That makes sense. And that what it will be will meet or exceed the expectations that have to get set. So while a new Brothers in Arms game genuinely appears to be in development at Gearbox, and the current circumstances of the industry are opportune for the series to return, it remains to be seen whether the project will actually blossom into anything substantial. is made possible by the generous support of our patrons. If you enjoy our content, consider subscribing to our channel and checking us out on Patreon. Thank you.